Good morning. Good morning. I'll wait for everyone to walk in. There's a stream of people coming through the door. Well, I want to work, welcome everyone to the uh, morning worship service of Harvest Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's good to see all the, of our uh, regular attenders uh, as well as all the uh, visitors that we have this morning. So thank you for coming. Uh, for our visitors, if you would, uh, we have these uh, tan cards in front of you that if you wish to uh, contact the church, uh, leave a record of your attendance, uh, please fill those out and uh, drop those off in the uh, offering plate or, or hand them to uh, someone uh, after the service. Uh, we'd like to draw your attention to pages 9 and 10 of the uh, bulletin for some announcements. Uh, I would like to just uh, draw your attention aware that our fellowship meal uh, is this evening at uh, five o'clock uh, here. So bring a meal, uh, let's fellowship uh, with each other uh, so that we all can provoke each other love and good works. Uh, I will like to note that um, I think several of us do have an email from Mary that is the June fellowship meal is a talent show. So please consider this week partake, participating in that, uh, sharing your all's talent uh, with us. And she would like to know by the end of this week or next? Next week is fine so that she can uh, go ahead and, and set that uh, talent show up for us. So if you have a, a bludgeoning talent, uh, you're a uh, comedian, uh, have some jokes that you would like to share, songs that you would like to share, uh, please uh, get with Mary and uh, that's be set for uh, the June Fellowship Meal. So now let's turn our attention to the purpose of our gathering this morning, uh, the worshiping of our risen Lord uh, and Savior. If you need a bulletin, uh, please get one from the back. Um, if you're watching online, I know we had some issues with the website, but the website's up, so you should be able to download a bulletin uh, from about 10 o'clock uh, this morning on. So uh, you'll need one of those bulletins. So, so let us uh, pray and invoke God's blessing on our uh, worship service. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, from whom comes down every good and perfect gift. Your holy name is holy and wondrous altogether. Father of lights, changeless in your mercy, invariable in your grace, your name is glorious and blessed altogether. Receive us in Christ, the light of the world, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Bring us into your presence that we might become radiant in your service, lights in the world reflecting the light of eternity. To you be all radiance, O Father of light, O Son, light of light, O Spirit, burning fire within our hearts, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise as we call each other in the serve to worship. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But it is, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy 
to suffer dishonor for the name. And in every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Jesus is Jesus. Let us continue to worship him in song. Sing God Moves. God moves in a mysterious way, His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Yes, he rides upon the storm. Sing deep and unfathomable. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will yes he works his sovereign will ye fearful saints fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Yes, he hides a smiling face. Ye fearful saints, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purpose, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Oh, yes, sweet will be the flower. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on and scan his word. Interpreter, and he will make it plain. Oh, yes, he will make it plain. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage, take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head.
Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to God. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Sing merciful. Merciful God, O oh, abounding in love, faithful to all who draw near you. The cry of the humble in heart, showing the cross they may cling to. Broken I come, helpless in sin, found at the feet of your mercy. Father, forgive, may my sin be remembered no more. Merciful God, 
Oh, abounding in love, faithful through times we have failed you, selfish in thought and uncaring in deed, foolish in word and ungrateful, Spirit of God, conquer our hearts with love that flow from forgiveness cause us to yield and return to the mercy of God merciful God oh abounding in love Faithful to keep us from falling, guiding our ways with your fatherly heart, growing our faith with each testing. God, speed the day, struggles will end, fullness will gaze on glory then we will stand overwhelmed by the mercy of God let us confess our faith together with these questions from Westminster Shorter Catechism Christian, what is adoption? Adoption, adoption is a free act of God's grace is whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the Son of God. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. Hear these words from Psalm chapter 34. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What, is, what man is there who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. All their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Please be seated. Will you please join your hearts and minds together as I lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Abba, Father, in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom I live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom I live. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, a God who re relents from sending calamity. My trespasses are multiplied before you. My sins testify against me, for my transgressions are with me, and I know my iniquities, transgressing and lying against the Lord, departing from my God, speaking oppression and revolt, uttering lies my heart has conceived. Search our hearts, O Lord. 
Show us our sins that we might confess them and might repent of them. Show us how our hearts have lied to us so that we might repent. Show us how we have spoken oppression and revolt against our fellow man and against you, O Lord. You lavishly pour out your grace, your mercy upon us. You have given us your Son, that through him we might have forgiveness of our sins, that we might stand clothed in his righteousness, which is now our own. May I not be like those rocky places on whom seed was thrown, who hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, last only a short time. When affliction or persecution comes because of the world, they quickly fall away. It may not be like those among the thorns on whom seed was sown, who hear the words, but the worries of this world, the deceitful news of riches and pleasures, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it immature and unfruitful. Instead, may I be like the good soil on whom seed was sown, whom with a noble and good heart hears the word, understands and accepts it, and with perseverance bears fruit. Help us, Lord. Change our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. May our minds be transformed. Transform us that we might hear your word, that your word would take root in our heart mind and soul. Revive us, remake us into your image. Help us to understand that we are no longer slaves to sin, but heirs with your son, Jesus Christ. Refresh us with your word this morning. We pray that you would speak through Eric, animate his words, that we might be admonished, encouraged, and comforted. We pray that your spoken word would assure us of who we are, of our identity in Christ, of our full and complete adoption, of our victory over sin and death. Help us, Lord, to develop an eternal perspective, a perspective that comforts us, encourages us in times of trial. Help us, Lord, to renew our minds with the truth that we might not be deceived by the things of this world. Give us greater skill in each area of life, Lord, we pray that you, we may prosper in all things and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. Give us greater love and compassion towards each other, especially when we disagree. Give us greater love and compassion for our loved ones, for those who do not know your son, for those in need. We pray that you would reveal to us our next pastor who will faithfully bring us your word. Sustain us until we can discern your will. Prepare him to lead this congregation, to preach your word, to administer the sacraments. Prepare us to call that man as you reveal your will to us. We pray for those who feel the absence of a loved one, a prodigal far from home, a family member who has passed away, a spouse or friend who has left and hasn't been heard from since. You, Christ, knew what it was like to experience loss and absence. And may your precious presence and truth bring healing and hope to those who mourn. We pray for those whose heart and flesh are failing. The weight of mortality bears upon their soul. You, Lord, took on flesh. You endured a brokenness of body so that we might know through your resurrection that life begins when we embrace you and extends towards an eternity of restoration where pain and sickness seeks. May your promises bring joy to the weary, hope to the mournful heart. I quickly pray this morning for Ray, for Dan, for Dave Osborne and Andy Christensen as they struggle with cancer. Heal them, Lord. Remove the cancer from their bodies and extend their lives here on earth. We pray that you would heal Ron, heal his heart, strengthen him, and allow his body to keep fluid retention under control. We pray that you would sustain the Olsons, help Jackson to sleep, 
and give them wisdom and endurance to Tim and Lindsay as they discern how to respond to Jackson, his new behaviors. Sustain them, Lord, encourage them, and give them strength for their upcoming move. We pray that you would strengthen our mission partners all over the world. We pray for all in danger or hardship that they may be renewed in courage and faith and hope. We pray for Jonathan and Rebecca. Comfort them, protect them. Let them rest in the knowledge that Jesus is praying for them as he prays for us and so that they are not overcome. Help them to believe that they are your adopted sons and daughters and that no one can remove them from your hand. Guide them as they prepare to leave Clarkson and help them to heal and help them to pre prepare them to minister to overseas. We pray for those who are in Kenya visiting heart to heart and we pray that you would continue to provide for the school and orphanage, that your word would go forth from there changing the lives of those not only in the school, but changing the lives of their community, city, and nation as well. Christ has appeared once and for all at the end of the age to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for man to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sins, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly wait for him. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mo mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your salvation. You reached down from one on high and took hold of me. You drew me out of deep waters. You delivered me from my strong enemy from those who hated me, for they were stronger than I. Who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We now come to the point where we continue to worship him with the giving of his tithes and our offerings. We give not to be blessed, but rather because we have been blessed. Our song of preparation is from the Red Hymnals, number 359. Uh, please grab a hymnal and stand as we sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Blessed be He, the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our fathers roam, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comfort. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other those the sympathizing king. When we asunder part, we give us inward pain, but we shall still be joined above and hope to meet again. This glorious hope I buys a courage by the way while each in expectation lives and longs to see the day from sorrow toll and pain and sin we shall be free and perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. You may take your seats. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to the third epistle of John. That seems like quite a jump, I know, to go straight to 3 John, but we're sort of continuing to, to pick up books that haven't been preached on here in a while, and 3 John was out there by itself, so we wanted to address that. We wanted to actually just learn from that before we go back into the Old Testament. And I have to tell you, this has been especially convicting, especially challenging passage of Scripture um, for me. It's a risk, I think, sometimes to, as you're sitting and listening to someone speak, to assume that they are further along than they really are. For you as we read through 3 John together. And let's do that now. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you. out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever is good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We, have, we also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. Let's pray. Father, if you are not present, then this is in vain. If we're just people left to ourselves to gather together and sing songs and say things that make us feel good, then this is in vain. And so we ask that we would be aware of your presence. Holy Spirit, teach us to love as we ought. Cause us to love as you love us. Teach us to love each other. Teach us to love truth. And lead us there in Christ Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. In 2000, a group, a Christian group named DC Talk, which some of you will remember, released a song and it was called Love is a Verb. Love is a Verb. I think that's a helpful idea for us to have as we move through this chapter so that we don't relegate the idea of love to sentiment, to sappy emotionalism. That's not the case. It's active. Soren Kierkegaard writing has said, love is the expression of the one who loves, not of the one who is loved. And in this case, at least, I think he's correct. I'm not recommending his theology or recommending him as a philosopher, but that statement is true. And we see it in 1 John 4.10, where John writes, this is love, not that we love God, but God loved us and sent his son. And love here is active. God didn't just feel a certain way about us. And we don't see the truth proclaimed where there is not active love as a result. And so we'll see that, that love here is active, that it's who God truly is, and it's what God truly does. And we might even say, and I think we see here, that love is the expression of truth. Love is the expression of truth. So we're going to look at five points that I would, I would like us to walk through today. And we'll, we'll be looking at familial love. Primarily, this is the love within the family of God, within the body of Christ. And so first we'll look at It shows up. Now, when we talk about familial love, and I've alluded to this a bit, we're talking about love in the church, in the church body, and within or for the family of God. And it's not just a general feeling. It's not just showing up and saying, I feel good in general about these people. I like to be around these people. It's not driven by just our emotions and how we feel. It doesn't even really relate to liking or to enjoying particular people. That actually typically would come after love, not as a precursor, as a cause for it. We're talking about agape love. We're talking about selfless love, sacrificial love. It's love that's exemplified in God's love for us. And of course, it's most profoundly demonstrated in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, taking on flesh, living a sinless life, and dying in our stead at Calvary on a cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And just to help you get your mind around that, the love that we're talking about as we go forward, I want you to think about that love of Christ, that it's the love of the just for the unjust. It's the love of the sinless for the sinful. It's the love of one who has no needs. He needs no thing. Meeting the greatest needs of those of us who are entirely unable to meet our own needs. And it's the love of the one who's worthy to be sacrificed to, becoming a sacrifice for those of us who are entirely unworthy. That's the example of love that Christ gives to us That's the love we're called to live in and to walk in, to demonstrate. And that's what we mean by love and familial love. So as we looked at the text, 3 John verse 1, first let's talk about familial love is personal. And we see it very very clearly there. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Letters are beautiful things. Even in our tech age where messages are quick and easy, emails are quick and easy, there's lots of ways that we can chat. But man, when somebody takes time to write you a letter, that's powerful. When someone sits down 
with their pen in hand and hand writes a letter and signs it, that's especially meaningful. They've invested for your good. Those are such encouraging things. And so we have here John, the elder, who is writing to Gaius a letter to express this very thing. How much he loves and values Gaius who walks in the truth. It's because of the gospel and how Gaius is loving others. So John has set aside this time to write a particular letter. Now it would have been read, of course, by the whole church. It would have been passed on. But it's incredibly personal as it begins. As John writes to his beloved friend. The name Gaius here is one that's used other places in scripture, but we don't really have any way to connect this particular man to those other individuals. So as far as we know, this is the one time this particular individual is addressed as John writes to him. Gaius was likely a disciple of John, and we see that because of their relationship. John writes to him and identifies himself as the elder. He does the same thing in the second epistle identifying himself as the elder to the church, to a larger body of people. But here it's the elder writing to Gaius. Now that elder has two meanings. Likely both of them are included here. John has gotten older. He's an older guy. And so this word, this presbyteros word, could just mean an older man. But it's more than that as we see their relationship. And when we look at how it's used in other places in scripture, including the second epistle, This is John the elder positionally in the church. John holding the office of elder. And that would include eldership or leadership over Gaius. So this isn't just spiritual maturity, old age, but spiritual authority that John is writing in. You'll note that, um, and we won't turn there, but you'll note in 1 Peter 5 that Peter identifies himself with the same title as a fellow elder. And then he admonishes the other elders to shepherd the flock of God that are among them. So it's that same idea we see here. John has a ministry role in the life of Gaius. And that's grown into a sincere and profound love and a deep friendship. So as an elder, John, like all elders, has charge to shepherd the flock. And this is one of the ways that he is shepherding the flock of God in shepherding Gaius in particular. I'll note, note here just for you to think about and appreciate, and we can come back to this another time, but John is referencing the office of elder in particular here in this title. And the work of the elder is to shepherd, just so we know we're, we're clear on our terms. And in our denomination, but I think in scripture, there are two offices. There are elder and deacons. Those are the two offices. So the office is elder here that John is addressing and the ministry, the function of the elder is to shepherd or pastor. That word pastor comes from the Latin. So as we translate from Greek to Latin, from poimen to pastor is the Greek. And then we use that in our English language and we use it in a lot of different ways. But in the scriptural context, it's what the elder does the elder pastors, the elder shepherds. And so John, in writing this letter, is shepherding, he's pastoring Gaius, who he loves. Notice that it says in verse 1 that it's who he loves in truth. It's who he loves in truth. And this is the first place we begin to see those ideas linked together. John doesn't just love him. It's not just a greeting. It's not something he throws down on the letter. I feel good about you and now I'm going to get on to the other stuff. It's I love you in truth. I sincerely love you. I really love you. So he's talking about the sincerity of his commitment in actively loving Gaius. And he's loving him even in the writing of this letter. But it's also love that's grounded in truth. And that's the truth of the gospel again. Apart from who God is and apart from what Christ has done, we would have no understanding of love. And even knowing these things to be true, if we look around our church and our culture, we'll see the word love abused many, many times. And we will, probably all of us in our own speech, misuse it today and I'm not condemning you for every time you use love wrong in a sentence it's sin but it's become a flippant word for us 
It's overused and misused. This love is love that's grounded in the truth of who Christ is. And it's because of the work of Christ in John and it's because of the work of Christ in Gaius that they have this relationship that's intimate and it's loving. We see this pattern in Christ's teaching, his speaking in the Gospel of John. John 17, 17, in the high priestly prayer we read, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Truth is the foundation of all that we are and all that we do. That truth of who God is and what Christ has done. Jesus even standing before Pilate. And we, we know this. This is an off-read Easter um, passage. But in John 18... Verse 37, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who was the, is of the truth, excuse me, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Again, there's the foundation for who we are in Christ, the truth. That's the reality of who we are. That's what Doug prayed about, that we would know this in Christ, that we would be convinced in Christ of where we are positionally because of the work of Christ, not because anything that we've done, but because of who Christ is and what he has done. And we can stand confident and assured in that. And so this love that's grounded in truth is no lip service kind of love. It's gospel centered, Christ like service. Notice also in this personal love, this familial love that's personal, that John is engaged in Gaius' life. He's not just writing him kind of the booster support letter and sending him on his way, but John is active and engaged, participating in his life. And this is a challenge for us, isn't it? It takes time. It's hard work. There's things that I would rather be doing than be invested and engaged in other people's lives. I have to be selfless to do that. It's hard for Christian leaders, wherever we are, it's difficult. And yet it's the call and it's the example that Christ has given to us. It's a challenge for us as Christian brothers. It's a challenge as we love in our community, even outside of the church and outside of these walls. And that's because love is service. It's not sentiment. Love is being engaged in the lives of the people around us. We're going to come back to that idea later on. But John is actively involved and engaged in Gaius' life. In verse 2, John actively prays for Gaius. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Again, I think this is a challenge for us. How many times do we say, I'm praying for you, or do we add that as a tagline, praying for you, or a quick text, praying for you, and then never invest in the work of prayer? the hard work of prayer. It's an easy thing to say, but love does. Love prays, love intercedes for our brothers. And notice how John prays. This is not what we would look at and think of as the most spiritual prayer in all of scripture. He prays that it will go well for Gaius. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you. That's all of life, that it's going well. Now keep in mind, all of this is grounded in the truth. That it will, we will go well with you in the truth. Based on, again, who God is. What Christ is doing. The call of Christ. So I pray that it will, be, it will go well with you. You'll be su- successful. You'll prosper is actually the word there. That you'll prosper in all of life. And that you may be in good health. You'll be physically strong and stable and able to do the work to which you've been called so that you can prosper, be successful in what God has called you to do in the truth. He prays for his success. He also prays for him to prosper in his soul, spiritually to grow, spiritually to be grounded, spiritually to mature in the faith, spiritually to continue to walk in a manner of the calling to which he has been called. This is not prosperity gospel. This isn't name it, claim it. This is a sincere desire that John has 
for Gaius to be able to do and be everything that God has specifically called him to do. The task that he has been given grounded in the truth of the gospel. And notice that John doesn't just pray. He doesn't just write a note. He doesn't just pray a single prayer. But he stays engaged with Gaius so that he knows what's going on in his life. He knows, verse 3, that he's walking in the truth. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. He's watching Gaius. He's tracking the reports. He's listening to what he hears about the ministry. He's investing in it. He's taking the time. He's keeping track to know that Gaius is doing what God has called him to do. He's an example. And I want to encourage him to press on. Keep doing what you're doing. You're walking in truth. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you were walking in the truth. That's significant. Those are two different ideas as they're written individually, but they fit together. Everything that Gaius says is true. Everything that Gaius has committed himself to as the truth is the truth. It's grounded in the gospel. He's not making up his own truth and everybody's saying that's okay. What's good for you is good for you and keep after that. It's what he is doing, what he is claiming is true. The service that he is offering is true and consistent with what Christ has commanded. What he says is true is in fact the truth of the gospel. He holds fast to the truth. He's learned it, likely from John, been taught it, and he lives it out in a loving way. And John, who has learned it at the very feet of Christ, is also living it out in this letter before us. In verse 5, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. Again, John knows the ministry. He's encouraging him. These things you're doing, they're good, they're faithful, they're consistent with the truth. In the day, this would have been traveling evangelists, men of God, sincere men of God that were moving from one area to another, carrying the gospel message. And they would go to where they were believers and they'd be cared for, they'd be fed, maybe given funds, and then sent along their way to continue their ministry. And so Gaius is that guy in the body that's looking for the people that are coming with the gospel so that he can encourage them, so that he can equip them, so he can bring the church together to equip them with what they need, to give them the things that they need to go on in communicating the gospel. Gaius is all about this. He's making Christ known by equipping Sometimes we're not good at this. Sometimes other things like jealousy or conviction get in the way so that we're not able or willing to celebrate the success of Christ working in someone else. We'll look for reasons not to like that person, to condemn their ministry, to criticize what they're doing, instead of just saying, praise God, the gospel's going forth. That was Paul's example, was it not? Regardless of the motives of those that were communicating the gospel, Paul said, hallelujah, the gospel's being preached. And it's the gospel that's the power of God into salvation. He rejoices greatly. He has no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. No greater joy. Does that bring you great joy? to see people walking in the truth. One of my favorite times here and and in our small group are those times where I can kind of back out of the events that are going on around me and just watch the conversations. And I really do love it. I love seeing people inside of the body of Christ loving each other. 
It's so fun as a leader in the church to stand out in the foyer and to look back in here at the end of a Sunday morning and see the conversations that are going on. To see the body of Christ loving the body of Christ. It is a beautiful thing. It is perhaps the most encouraging thing to see. And John says he has no greater joy than to hear that his children, those that are his disciples, those perhaps that he has communicated the gospel to as a means by which they are saved, the Holy Spirit then converts them. And so he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth, living in the truth. These brothers, verse 5 and 6, these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. And so John is thrilled and he's telling Gaius, this is awesome. Keep going, press on, keep doing this. He writes to encourage. He prays, he knows, he hears, and he writes to encourage. How do we follow up with people? John makes a point of writing to say well done and to press on. How do we follow up with people? When we meet someone or we're visiting with someone and they tell us what they're, what's on their heart, good or bad, what they're asking God to do, what they're begging God to do, the needs that they have, and we say, well, I'll pray for you. And we might even stop right then and pray for them. I would encourage you to do that. When someone tells you a need and you have the opportunity to pray then, pray then. Pray with them then, on the phone, via text, however you're talking, pray with them then. But then follow up. It's not one prayer and done. And there are, there are members in this body, there, there's people, I just want to call out names, that do this so well, that are such examples of this kind of love in the church body. But if I call out names, I'm going to miss somebody. And I, I don't want to offend anyone, but I, but I love those phone calls that I get. I'll, I'll call out one. Um, when, when my dad died, sorry, when my dad died, Grant wouldn't be deterred in calling me. I, I, don't, I don't really like, um, in those situations, it's easier for me to kind of stop communication and just navigate what I have to do. But he called and he kept calling until I answered the phone. That's a great example of this. How do we follow up? How do we pursue people that we're praying for? Are we checking in midweek or on the day of or praying for them at the time when they're in the hospital, when they're at the doctor's office, when they're in the courtroom, whatever it is on the negative side, or when they're celebrating, when they're being promoted, whatever the occasion is, how do we follow up with them? John says there's no greater joy. Nothing makes him happier. Secondly, and we'll move quick, more quickly through these, familial love is familial. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's the truth. Our familial love isn't just the people that we like, the people that we're naturally attracted to, the people that kind of fit in with the things we want to do. Familial love is for the whole family. We love the whole body of Christ, that's the command. We give ourselves convenient and easy outs. And it's sin. It is, it's just sin. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts in verse 5 for those brothers, strangers as they are. Strangers, people we don't know. But they're in Christ. They're part of the family. And so we love them and love them well. That's the call. Gaius is loving the brothers and serving Christ. A people he doesn't know. All he needs to know is, are you in Christ? Is the gospel you're proclaiming true? I am all about supporting you. And I'll do everything I can as you're passing through here to make sure you're ready to go to keep doing that. We'll feed you food, we'll bind you wounds, we'll give you funds, whatever we can do, so that the truth is proclaimed. We'll love you well. Look at the pattern, look at the, the reach of this. Verse 5, beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified 
to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Wow. In a manner worthy of God. Do we love and care for people in a manner that's worthy of God? That's a worthy sacrifice to God? Do we love people like that? Remember, this is the same Christ we talked about who purchased us. Who didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so he humbled himself. What is he not worthy of? And John's encouragement is, keep it up, Gaius, and send them on in a manner worthy of God, that appreciates the worth, the infinite worth of God, the infinite value of God. And so what can we rightly withhold from God? Man. Are we caring in a way like that? Because that kind of love testifies to the truth. That kind of love says, yes, I believe what Christ did. I believe in his sacrifice. I believe that I was deserving of death and he saved me. God become man. Saved me. And so what am I willing to sacrifice as an example in love of what Christ has done? That's a high calling. Verse 7, for they have gone out for the sake of the name Than every person that's being written about right here in this context. I'm not giving us per permission not to love others, but here in particular, it's those that are going out for the sake of the name. This is, this is Dan and Melanie and Sherry as they go to Kenya and they go out for the sake of the name. This is the MTW mission work that we support in Greece. This is the new work that's transitioning back into the Middle East. They go out for the sake of the name. And so, as family, we love them. And we should send them in a manner worthy of God. Worthy of the sacrifice, the example that Christ has given to us. Verse 8, therefore we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers in the truth. We're a part of that. We're working with them. They can't go. How shall they go unless they be sent? It was a sad thing, a tragic thing for us to make a decision to cut missions giving in this church. To be able to see and say there are things that we would love to do and cannot do. But in doing these things, we become fellow workers for the truth, fellow workers for the gospel. It is no little thing to send people well. That's how the gospel is carried. This is why we give to missions. Thirdly, Familial love protects, verses 9 and 10. Familial love protects. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. This is the complete opposite of what we see in Gaius. Everything that John is commending in the life of Gaius, this man is contradicting. He's building his own kingdom, his own private church under his authority and his name. And anyone who comes from the outside, he's keeping from coming in, even those that come in the name of Jesus in truth. And those that want to help and those that want to serve, he's kicking out of the church. He puts them out. He's putting an end to hospitality. He's putting an end 
to serve as he's an obstacle to the proclamation of the gospel, which is truth. And there's no love in that. He's rejecting Christ's appointed authority in John. He's not caring for loving the brothers. He's closed off the members of his body. And in all these things, he's rejecting Christ. And in the text, he apparently is blind to that. Family love loves the whole family. Inside harvest the believers, outside of harvest the believers. Believers of different traditions and different backgrounds we love as brothers and sisters who are in Christ. I read part of Kierkegaard's quote earlier. Here's the whole of it. Love is the expression of the one who loves, not of the one who is loved. Those who think they can love only the people they prefer do not love at all. Love discovers truths about individuals that others cannot see. Again, I'm not universally recommending Kierkegaard. I I think it's beautiful when men like this stumble across, by the grace of God, the truth. And this statement is true. You see, the summary is, this is not your body. This is not our body at harvest. And I know what we mean when we say our church. This is where we serve. This is where we participate. I understand that. But sometimes what we say gets carried a little farther into what we believe and how we act. And this is not our church. This is the body of Christ. And so Christ decides how we love and how we serve and who is a part of the family. It's the church of Christ, the body of Christ, and we serve Christ as he calls and instructs us, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. And then in Colossians 1, 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. How do we love? Who do we love? Whoever Christ tells us to love and however Christ tells us to love them. And always looking to the gospel and his sacrifice as the pattern of what love is. We serve Christ so that he is rightly seen and exalted here and in the world around us. And Christ is so gracious. People around you that love you and that you can love. Do you know how many people in the world desire that? A friend? It's a gift and he draws us in and he says, this is love, love like this. And you know what comes out of loving like this? Liking people, caring for people, being genuinely involved, wanting to be around those people because we love first. Everything else flows out of that. It's Christ who's preeminent. We love like him. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The goal of those good works, the ultimate goal, as much as we might love our own denomination, and, and we do, but the ultimate goal is to proclaim Christ and his kingdom, not to build our own. Fourthly, familial love instructs, instructs, John is writing and telling Gaius, you're doing this well, and I want to encourage you, and not just you, but everyone who's going to read this letter, verse 6, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. We're coming back to that. It wasn't just a command for Gaius. And John is instructing, this is how you need to do this. You're doing it well. Keep doing it. And so we have to here be faithful. we can give to missions and ministries that
people like these that we may be so that Jesus' name is named as Lord and Christ because Jesus alone saves. John instructs, don't imitate evil, but imitate what is good. He gives a negative. How we do things matters. How we love, how we send, how we support those things matter. We don't slander other ministries. We don't talk badly about other ministries because we're jealous of their success. We don't find fault where the gospel is being preached. We say, praise God. That needs to be our heart. And then we need to imitate what is good as John does. We celebrate what God is doing in the church and around the world. We celebrate what other small groups are doing. Because God is at work there. It's not a competition. We're the body of Christ. We celebrate what God is doing in discipleship groups. Men's and women's groups. Because we're involved in kingdom work. Because we love Christ. And we want Christ's name to be proclaimed. And so we love all those. We serve and support all those who cling to the truth and proclaim it rightly. Verse 12, we have an, a positive example. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Notice that. They look at this man, Demetrius, and they say he's got a good testimony. Everybody says he's doing good, but it doesn't stop there. Everybody says that, and then when we look to the truth, he is doing good. He measures up to the standard of God's word. And so then he's held up as an example. Imitate that because he's following Christ. With good reports from people around him. With a life that's consistent with the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's word. He speaks and he represents the true gospel. Why do we imitate good? Why is it that we imitate good? I know that sounds like a, a simple thing, but why do we do that? Not just because it's good, not just because God said so, although that's an excellent reason to do anything, but we do it to point people to Christ because that's who Christ is. That's who God is in his nature. He is good. How do we represent him? By being like Christ so people can look to us and see Christ and want to know him. That's our place in this equation. Look, no one is going to come to me and ask me to be a spokesman for their hair care products. No one's going to do that. It would be foolish to do that. I have no ground to stand on to market those products to anybody. It would drive them away. So do our lives draw people to Christ? Does how we love draw people to Christ? We don't have to be perfect. We can't be perfect. That's not the call. But our life should be a proof, a testimony. We should exhibit the work of Christ so that people can see it. And that's not just something I'm saying we should do, but that's what the world is looking for, and they should. In John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Why? Verse 35, by this... All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The world is looking at us. The world is judging us fairly, rightly. They're looking at us and saying, is there something there? They can come here and peel back the doors in the morning on a Sunday and stick their head in and they want to see, is there something different here? Or am I just as, just as good, just as well off to be on the golf course or in the yard or anything else? Is there anything different? Is there anything that we're doing here in love, in truth, in service that's overflowing out into the streets? It's pouring out into the neighborhoods or in the city of Jacksonville in the parks, in the businesses, 
in the schools? Is it real to us and are people seeing it? I read from a, a quote from Booker T. Washington last week. I have one more this week. It's one that we discussed even in small group this week. He writes, I think that the whole future of my race hinges on the question as to whether or not it can make itself of such indispensable value that the people in the town or state where we reside will feel that our presence is necessary to the happiness and well-being of the community. And that made me think of the church. Christian, are we of indispensable value to our community? Does our community see us and feel that our presence is necessary to their happiness and well-being? Does our community see and know us at all? And if not, why not? Lastly, familial love shows up. I'll try to finish quickly here, but this is so important. Very simple and critical importance. Verses 13 and 14, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. He had more to write, more he could have written. Lots of other things he wanted to write, but he would rather show up. He'd rather be there face to face. I love letters. They're encouraging. They're of great important significance. Write letters, encourage the body, and show up. Show up when people ask you to show up, if at all possible. None of us can do everything, but we must take the time to show up, to talk face to face, to be present in the act of loving, the act of serving one another. It says to a person, even more than a letter, you matter. You matter to me, and so I'm going to come to where you are so that I can be with you, so I can look in your face. It could be a celebration again, a party, a performance, a game, or a doctor's office or a court or the hospital, or anything else. Love shows up. It sets aside the time to be present. Don't be stopped by your understanding of the importance of the event. Oh, that game's not really a big deal. I can catch another one down the road. If someone invites you to something and you can make it, make it. Even if you have to juggle, and again, there are some people that I'm saying this that I'm thinking of in this body who set such a beautiful example of always showing up. Christ says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we're never alone. Christ is with us always. And we need to be asking ourselves, in which, what ways can I go with Christ? Can I carry Christ to show up for others? Be there for people. If someone takes the time to invite you, most of the time it's because it matters to them that you're there. And when you go, you carry the gospel of truth. And so that question should always be in our mind. How can I carry Christ? How can I carry the gospel? How can I live and be a living example of what Christ has done for us? By showing up. Sinclair Ferguson writes, the gospel is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And our lives are to be the embodiment of that good news. I'm going to read that again. The gospel is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And our lives are to be the embodiment of that good news. I challenge you to wrestle with this. I ask you to read John 3 again and again. Maybe flip to other parallel passages, go back and read, excuse me, I said John 3, 3 John, and flip back to 2 John and read that again and again. And then go to parallel passages to see what this love looks like. To see how we're called to love in service to each other. But I also want to challenge you now, even as I pray, to consider where we need to repent. Individually and as a church. Where I have, where we have failed to love in a way that says, 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do confess. We do repent. And this is a beautiful thing. It's not a thing that should make us feel separated from you. But it's a privilege and a joy to be able to climb up into your lap, as it were, and say, I'm so sorry. And know that we're loved. Know that we've been saved, that we are justified. Know that you are faithfully working in us and we are walking with you so that we are sanctified, made like Christ. And then as you call us to repentance personally, open the eyes of this body corporately to see how we better love each other and then how we better love beyond these walls because if we love each other well here, it's going to pour out into the streets. We see this repeated in Acts, Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 6 again as the church gets some internal ministry right. And we constantly see that you add to the body of Christ as a result. And then remind us again as we come to the table. The price, the sacrifice the love that was poured out for us, that we might be saved, that we might truly be loved and love, that we can even know what love is. We praise you and thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, we read, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we bless you for the son of your love. He who has died and is now alive forevermore He who has satisfied all your righteous requirements and brought us to your house, to your throne, to your very self again, that we may be justified as we stand before you, welcome, known and claimed as your very children. We are utterly indebted to you, Lord Jesus, and we give you all glory and honor. Enable us to remember you in this sacrament and in the whole of our life. Please bless these elements and set them apart. 
for your purposes, for your willing uh, transformation of our hearts, our minds, our souls, our whole life. Be our all in all, Lord. We give ourselves to you again. In Christ we pray. In your holy triune name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ has died for me and for you. Astonishing. I don't know anyone else who would die for me. I don't know anyone who should. And because of that, he has changed our lives. He has taken our lives from us, given us his life, but he's taken over our lives. We're bound to him, we're obligated to him, we're indebted to him, we're in love with him because he's died for us and lives forever to indwell us. We are not our own. We've lost our lives because Jesus has come to us and bought us and made us his. Amazing. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and said, this is my body which is given for you. And after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the remission, the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink it. Do you, do you understand? Do you understand what we're doing here? Because Christ has done this for us. Is this an unknown? Is this just an abstract thought? If Jesus has died for you, you are welcome at this table. If by faith you know the Lord Jesus and you want to know him more and more, you're welcome at this table. If that is extraneous or uninteresting or unrealistic, please do not come to this table. Wait for a day when you really know Jesus and you treasure him. It's our custom to come down these side aisles or receive the elements. Elders, please come uh, and receive the elements. We, we like to hold the elements until all have been served and then partake together. That isn't always possible. If you need to, to, uh, to not wait, that's, that's good also. You come as you are prepared and receive the elements.
Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. All of you drink it. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are present. And by faith, we come to you and we trust in you. And we tell you we still believe in you and we want to follow you. As we have sung, we confess that we have failed you and we've fallen short day by day. But as incredible as it is, you still love us. You still welcome us at the throne of grace. And you still hold on to us. You still call us your own. Everything we are and have depends on you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified and enable us to love you more dearly, more truthfully, more sincerely, more consistently. Be our all in all. Fill our heart and soul and mind. Bless your holy name, Lord. There's none like you. You are truly wonderful. You are exalted, and we give you our praise. Father, Son, and Spirit, amen. Please stand and sing our closing hymn, number 358, For All the Saints. For all the saints who from their labors rest to thee by faith before the world confess thy name O Jesus be forever blessed oh hallelujah oh and their mind the Lord their captain in the well fought fire thou in the darkness fear their one true light oh hallelujah oh saints who nobly fought of old, and when with them the victory crown of gold, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah, the golden evening brightens in the west soon soon to faithful warriors comes their rest sweet is the calm of paradise a blast oh hallelujah oh hallelujah
Son, and Holy 